So, welcome everyone. We are happy to have with us today Jonathan Passant. Jonathan is currently a postdoc at the University of Bristol um, and I guess the Helbron Institute that we see now in front of our eyes. So he's working with Misha Rudnev. Um, I actually know jo I actually know Jonathan from a lot before that when he was a graduate student. Uh, a while back I was running a summer school for graduate students in MSRI about polynomial methods. And Jonathan really stood out there. Uh, I gave the students some open problems they can think of, and he actually thought hard about the problem and solved it and published the paper. And since then, I'm bothering him with other stuff. Um, we also did, mentored once a group of undergraduates in a research project, and it even won a $1,000 Young Researchers Award. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing what Jonathan is doing now, uh, which is apparently structural results about sets of points with a few triangles. Mm -hmm. I'll be quiet now and uh, let's go to you, Jonathan. Okay. Thank you, Adam, for that very nice introduction. And thank you to the other organizers for, for setting this up. Um, so I should say everything that I'm going to talk about today is joint with Sam Mansfield, who is also at the University of Bristol. He's a PhD student of Misha Rudnev. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to talk about rich wines or circles in sets with few triangles. Um, right. And so here's just the outline. So we'll give a quick introduction to distances and introduce us to triangles. Um, I imagine a lot of folks will be familiar with these concepts, but I want to just go through them and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'll talk a lot about previous work that has been done um, with this this question about what happens when you have few distances and then we'll talk about what me and Sam managed to prove um, over there and I will say I am known for going very quickly through uh, Zoom presentations in particular so if anyone has any questions please feel free to stop me at any time um, as, as I might just rattle through so okay so introduction to distances and so just to, so we're on the same page, we're going to take points P and Q, and they're going to be in two dimensions. And everything I talk about today will be in two dimensions. I don't know how to do anything in even three dimensions. So everything is in two dimensions, and we're just going to talk about Euclidean distance between the two. And we're going to denote this by P minus Q. And an object that we'll care a lot about is this set of distinct distances, where we take all possible distinct distances between points in our point set. Okay. And so we use this to count things. And there are a couple of examples you might think of straight away. One might be something like a lattice, and you might want to count distances here. So here, all these red distances would give you one thing to the count, and the blue distances would give you one an extra thing, and the green distance would give you a third thing. And something like a random set, you might get quite a lot of distances. In. And so you can come up with a very quick upper bound on something like the size of the distance set. It's just going to be something like p squared, which looks at all pairs. Um, okay, and this will happen in something like a random set. But if we look at something like a lattice, we would expect significantly fewer. Okay, and so this is the setting for Edish's distinct distance problem. It says, we're going to define this function that says, if we've got n points, what's the fewest possible distances these can make? And this is this fn. And the optimal, well, one of the optimal examples, we'll see a couple later, is this square root n by square root n lattice. And if you look at this, then it gives you n over square root log n distances. So this uses a, a result of Landau uh, on sums of how many integers can be some written as sums of squares. And so this gives you an upper bound on this function. Okay. And so this is what Edge is conjectured. Um, well, he asked about this and he said this should probably be the size asymptotically of this 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 minimal distance sets and he proved a lower bound into the half and then there was how many years of work 50 60 years of work uh various extremely good bounds kind of making this into nice fractions as you go up and eventually good cats in 2010 Found the lower bound n over log n. Okay. And so the key to this, and I'm going to talk about this because this will lead us nicely into why one might care about triangles, is 
that they reframe distances as conjugacy, conjugacy classes under the action of rigid motions. And so we're going to let this SE2 of R be the group of rigid motions, and it's going to act by either a translation of two dimensions or a rotation. And we can look at an equivalent relation on pairs, and we say that two pairs are equivalent if they describe the same distance. And we can recontextualize this using the group action. So this is sort of the one of the key things in this good catch result. And so if we have two distances that are the same, then there is going to be some action that takes one to the other. So here there's some rotation, but if the lines end up to be parallel, there is some translation. And so you can refer in this equivalence as saying they're equivalent if there exists an action that takes one to the other. And so this is why triangles are in some sense a natural generalization of distances. Because if you have two points, then you can take one to another via an action. And if you have congruent triangles, then there is going to be either a rotation or translation taking one to the other. So we should think of triangles as three points and distances as two. So we're sort of expanding by one point when we talk about congruency classes of triangles. Okay. And so the Gus Katz result allows you to very quickly get a lower bound, a sharp lower bound on triangle congruency classes. It's p squared as opposed to p over log p. And it's achieved in slightly more settings than for distances. So as we'll see uh, a little later on, we can get this by regularly spacing points on parallel lines. Something can come out of concentric circles. And there's also lattices with additive structure you can get um, this p squared coming up okay did anyone have any questions at this stage about anything no okay so now we're going to talk about a slightly different conjecture of edish that's harder so we're going to call a, a point set near optimal or distance near optimal if it achieves exactly p over square root log p distances and so the square the square root n by square root n lattice is one such example. And Edish in 1987 made this following conjecture that says any near optimal point set in the plane has a lattice-like structure. And then in the next sentence, he goes on to say, this is very vague, was dated, and probably not a great conjecture. And it's probably very hard. And so he he then goes on to state a slightly better conjecture that any near optimal point set p um, must contain a very rich line so it must have p to the half number of points in so if you have your square root n by square root n lattice this is clearly satisfied um, but he wants this for all such sets okay so we should talk about near optimal examples and so there are very few of these known um, there is the square lattice that we mentioned before. Uh, there is a triangular lattice, so you just offset every other row. And, oh, gone too fast. There is this uh, rectangular lattice, uh, or family of rectangular lattices. So this was, so Adam made me aware of this in a blog post on, on his blog. Uh, him and Ben Lund came up with this example in 2014, but it had already been sort of discovered in a different literature by Marie and Osborne in 2009. Do I but know the point this? is, <laughs> I don't remember this earlier paper. I, I <laughs> you you cite it in your book. I cited it. I remember that yeah, we did something with that. Oh well. No, no, this is the one you. This is the one you cite. My memory, um, my memory is not as good as it used to be. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think they they are referencing a paper of Conway in this one, but this is so they possibly generalized something slightly. Um, yeah, so if, uh, you can come up instead, as long as you're careful about constructing it, a rectangular version of this. And I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, these are all the examples we know, up to rotating and scaling things, right? But yeah, these are, these are essentially all the known examples of near optimal sets. Right, and that's one of my favorite problems. Yes. So hard to say so, anything. Yeah, I... I I have no idea how to say anything. I can say something today, but not on this, unfortunately. Okay. 
So the other thing I want to say is the structure of near optimal sets is extremely delicate. And so if we consider our lattice where now we unbalance it slightly, so this, this alpha you should think of as not being a half, then suddenly we collapse all the distance or the specific distance structure. So there is this result of Carilla, Sharia, and Sheffer from 2014 that says unless we're exactly a half, then we have a linear number of distances. So it's an extremely delicate problem. Uh, it turns out when you have triangles, life is much easier. Um, okay. And so instead, we should think about this, this Wang conjecture um, because we have some more hope here. And so um, the first thing we should say is that Semiredi already had an idea about this, this sort of thing. And he showed that you can find something that's square root log p rich. Um, and this is very much using the fact that we don't have a linear number of distances. Um, and you can improve this slightly. Um, so there are another blog post of Adams uh, that says that both Sharia, uh, so Mondinsky and Dazu, and Resin Sharia had a similar idea around 2014. So this is using the polynomial proof of Semiridi Trotter. Um, is there any near optimum? To be fair, this is, I would cite it as folklore. I definitely did not contribute much to this one. I just stated it. <laughs> but okay. Okay. I mean, I gave it to all the... Yeah, I really think I gave a different presentation where I contributed it to the people that came up with the polynomial proof of uh, Semiridi Trotter. Yeah. Because it essentially uh, came directly from there. But here right. I decided, decided to... <laughs> Thank you for the... Thank you for the credit. I do not deserve it. I just write, uh, I just document these things on the blog. <laughs> but there, there is there is value in documenting things because I don't know if I would have seen this without that. Or possibly I would have to think about it, but who knows? Is right. this in your book? Did you put this in the book? Yeah, yeah, it's an exercise. <laughs> exercise, yeah. Okay. I don't want to do an exercise. So the blog post is much, much nicer. Okay. And so the, the above results use this sort of construction here, and it uses this set of triples. And if you think about what this set of triples means, it means you've got PQ and a point on the perpendicular bisector. And you can count these in two ways. You count it from above in a very kind of uh, basic way. You can count it by P squared, which is the number of bisectors, and L max, which is the number of points on the biggest, the biggest one. And this turns out to to give you a, the, the same ready bound. And then from below, you just use Cauchy Schwarz. And this is a fun exercise for someone that gets bored later in the talk, maybe is to sit down and, and work this through. Can you say maybe what L max is again? I'm not sure I understand. Oh, of course. So, L, so you're trying to get a very rich wine. And so you take L max to be the number of points on the richest wine. So it's the maximum across all lines of L intersect P you still have a finite point set. I'll just say it again in my own words. Okay, I and understand now. Okay. 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 Yeah. And then, yeah, the wall bound is Cauchy Schwarz. And then the improvement in this comes from instead of this kind of crude upper bound, you can think instead about circles. So if you have a circle around A, it will have P and Q on, and then you look at incidence theory based on these circles. Okay. So yeah, so if you want a fun exercise for the rest of the talk, that is a, a slightly more entertaining one. Okay. And so the best result I know in this direction is, is due to Ben Wund, Adam Schaeffer, and Frank Tazoo. And it says that for any alpha bounded by a quarter, at least one of the following holds. So you either get uh, a P to the alpha number of points on a line, so a, a polynomially rich one, or there are lots of square root p rich ones. Okay, um, so it doesn't exactly guarantee you a polynomial line, but it's very close to it. Yeah, um, and so um, this relies on the bisector energy, which is why I was talking about the bisectors before. And so the bisector energy is just saying counting pairs of points that have the same bisector. So they're equidistant from, from R1. 
And if you improve the the, bisect, the bound on the bisector energy that's in their paper, you would get slightly more rich wines um, than they get. Okay. And this has been improved since, but not, not still optimal. Okay. And so the final thing I want to mention with stru uh, the structure of things is to talk about additive structure. And so we can talk about both if A is any sort of subset of an additive group, you can look at the sum set, which is the first thing, which is just all sums across all elements. And you can also look at the additive energy, which is where these sums collide. And if you want to talk about structure using the sum set, then it being close to the size of the set itself means it's quite additively structured, and it being close to the size of the set squared means it's relatively additively unstructured. I couldn't fit additive with a, so unfortunately, because it could still be quite structured and have A squared, but this is unfortunate. And the energy similarly is, well, inversely, is between A squared and A cubed and has the opposite relationship. So being close to the upper bound in this case means you're structured and being close to the lower bound in this case means you're unstructured. So this will be helpful for a bunch of the results that follow. I like to say, I, li I like the, I also use this vague notation of saying additively structures, even though it's not well defined. Uh, if it's completely new to someone, you can mm -hmm. think of structured as behaving someone like, somewhat like an arithmetic progression. It's not accurate, but it gives some of the correct right intuition. Yeah, and you'll see later that I have a lot of arithmetic progressions. I don't necessarily call these out, but I'll say things like regularly spaced. And, and whenever you see this, this just means arithmetic progression. I'm just not telling you where the progression is necessarily. Um, yeah. And so there's this question of next cats um, that says, suppose uh, a point set is distance near optimal, then the energy is large. So it should have some sort of additive structure. So you would hope to get it close to P cubed, the size of P cubed. And unfortunate to this approach, if you want to find a rich wine, then there's an issue to this. You need to be very, very close to P cubed. Because if you are polynomial distance away, you can always find a set that has no three points on a line and very high energy. So if you want to use this, then you need to make sure you're sat all the way at the top of the range. Okay. If you want to do this to find a rich one. Uh, how does up. this set look like? Do you know? So uh, the first one, I can't remember particularly that construction, but the second one is a sort of, um, oh, what's the name of the set that has no three APs? You construct it on a high dimensional sphere. And Baron's construction. Just, okay, yeah, yeah, Baron type construction. Okay, yeah. got it. That makes sense. Yeah, that's the kind of construction. Um. Yeah, I looked at the Edish uh, Ferredi Pack and Rouge one, and it didn't look exactly like a Baron type construction to me, but the, the Stan Chechu one definitely looks like a Baron type. So to find a rich wine, you need to be extremely close. But it's still showing additive structure if you, if you answer this. Okay. And so some work coming out of this was done on Cartesian products. Um, and so you can show if it's distance near optimal in various ways, then you do get additive structure. And so here, distance near optimal has been slightly weakened according to various authors. Um, but you should be able to bring this all the way down, hopefully, to something close to A to the 1 plus epsilon um, in this setting. But there was a bunch of papers in 2016, um, all sort of using the same identity about sums of squares in some way. Um, and nothing I know has been done since. Um, so Cosmin's bound in particular uses um, uh, Semiredi's, not Semiredi's, Solomoshi's uh, some product um, inequalities. Um, but even, uh, so Cosmin says in there that it's not clear that it follows from the full some product conjecture, and this is still open. So this is quite a fun problem, but I, I don't know how to make progress on it. I was trying to make progress on it for a while and, and failed, so... But yeah, fun open problem. Okay, so I should talk about triangle near optimal sets. Um, and they fall into three categories. Lattices, like we've already talked about. Essentially, in a lattice, you can always move whatever triangle you have down to the origin. And this will make sure you have P squared of them. Um, 
sets with few on few parallel lines. So here we have arithmetic progressions on uh, parallel lines. And this again means you have this, this ability to just transform any triangle that you care about to one of these four points, depending on its orientation, I guess. Um, and then we again get p square points. And the other construction we need to care about is concentric circles. And this again has this, this property. Okay. And it turns out as long as you don't have too many circles, you don't get too much coming from the interplay between circles. Um, okay. So the main result I want to talk about will, will be about sets that have these very few triangles. And so if we have MP squared classes of congruent triangles, then either we get a line that is polynomially rich for some sigma greater than zero. And you can also show that a positive proportion of your points are contained on lines parallel to this, each at least this rich. And the second one uh, is that there is a circle that contains a positive proportion of your points. So polynomial in both, the second one is much nicer. Um, okay. And so these positive constants only depend on M. The sigma I can tell you is awful, uh, but it does exist. You can sort of vaguely calculate it. It depends on both constants from Brotnev's point plane bound and a constant from uh, Freiman's theorem. Yeah, can I ask something? Yes. Uh... yes so in the first case, mm -hmm. um, can't you phrase it maybe nicer by saying that you repeatedly use this and then you get uh, that the constant portion of the point is contained on many lines with such um, with such number of points on them. You just throw the points, apply again, and throw the points, apply again after, until you have like half of the points gone. And you basically cover the whole point set with many lines. But can you guarantee they're parallel in the same? Uh, no, I don't know how they behave, <laughs> but uh, maybe. So, so I think you could probably do this. Oh. Uh, but the yeah, you get that these lines are parallel to each other and all this rich. So, so you do. Yeah. Sounds stronger. Yeah, I think it might be strong. Yeah, because you, you do use the additive. You end up showing that they have additive structure, and you can use this to show that they are, in fact, translates in a particular direction. Nice. Um, yeah. OK. Yeah, so this, this sigma is positive, but very tiny. And the, the actual constants I'm hiding here are something like 1 over 2 to the 300 or something astronomical. Um, but it does exist and it's polynomial and we have an energy version of this too so i'll give you a few definitions and then we can talk about the energy version of this then okay does it right. do any good the fact that uh, lines and circles are related by inversion transformations to think about it that way uh i've not thought about it this distance, way distance distance tend to be very sensitive to anything like inversion would completely destroy distances um, yes but uh i yeah okay maybe maybe so odd wall thought yeah yeah i think i had a thought along this lines at some stage i was trying to get so we'll come to it later but this circle case i was at some stage trying to do exactly the same method as the first one and this led to me having to deal with multiplicative energy over the complex numbers. And then it led to me having to deal with spirals. And this was a nightmare. And I could do it for about half the half the cases. I, I had two cases. I solved one of the cases. And the other one, I asked a couple of people. And they all went, oh, this sounds horrible and hard. Don't do this. And so I went back to the drawing board. And it led to a stronger result. So yeah. So we'll talk a little about what, what this comes out of later. Um, Okay. Yeah, and there's a good there's a well there's a good reason why we have this disparity between the powers of the two results. Uh, do Do you know that? Uh, uh, so so you said helices, right? Um, no, the, the spirals, the spirals. Complex spirals. Yeah. Uh, so originally the 
originally the, the reduction that Booth and Katz used mm -hmm. by Elokesh. And Elokesh got this, this, this These like weird helices, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And later it was improved. So maybe there's something similar oh. happening. Uh, maybe you can, yeah. So I will think about unpacking spirals in that uh, way. Yeah. Just yeah, I didn't think about that to be fair. I I yeah. It would give something of the power of the first result, right? So you would end up with this same sigma here as opposed to P to the one. So yeah, I gave up. But they have come up since, but so it might be useful. Okay. So just a quick um Definition. Um, so partial symmetries are things when they act on the whole set. Instead of preserving the whole set, they preserve k of that set. So here, theta we call a, a k-rich partial symmetry because it preserves k of the points of p. And so the first step in our proof, we show that um, if we have few classes of congruent triangles, then we essentially make the largest. Of, so the largest this k for b is the size of p. And we show that we get the maximum number of such, such symmetries. Um, and so I also want to briefly talk about the multiplicative energy um, because this is relevant for structures like circles and spirals, as we've just talked about. It leads to slightly different things. And given that we've got a point set over two dimensions that isn't a multiplicative group, we should talk about how we do this. And we do this just by embedding in the complex numbers and using complex multiplication. So. If we have a quadruple of points, if the first two points as complex numbers are multiplied together to give the second two points, then this this is what we define as a an additive, well, sorry, a multiplicative quadruple. Okay, and this is where spirals come from. Okay, so this is a, a custom definition, and so it says essentially that a set we will call maximally saturized saturated if for the richest in action can be which is p we have the maximum number of these which is approximately p so there's going to be some constant c1 and c2 so we can loosen our restrictions slightly so that everything that is at least c1 p rich there are at least c2 p of them okay and so this is if you look at the gus cats bound for how rich symmetries can be this is just saying we've got a maximum number of of these. Okay, and yeah, so it turns out, rephrasing that former statement, sets with few triangles are maximally saturated, so they have a lot of very rich actions. And so we can phrase the whole thing not based on triangles, but just phrased on this maximal saturation. And so. If something's maximally saturated, then the point set itself must have a maximal uh, additive energy. And if this is true, then we get our result about lines. So this uses the energy bound to get this result. And if that's not true, then there must be some Q where P minus Q has the maximal possible uh, multiplicative energy. So you can think of this as maybe you've got a whole bunch of concentric circles, but they're not based on the origin. Your Q is just going to transport you to the origin, where you can then think about multiplicative energy. Um, and independently of this, there is a circle that has P points. Okay, so that's the whole thing. And the constants in all of this are depending on the constants that came from saturation. So in our case, saturation is just based on the M from triangles. Okay, so this is a slightly more technical version, but this is what's underneath the triangle one. Okay. Oh, this is just reminding you of the original statement. Okay, did anyone have any questions about the statement before we go on and so I can summarize the proof briefly? Oh, you're welcome. No? Okay. All right. Oh, one more thing before I talk about the proof. So a lot of this uses group energy, which exists over the affine group, which has a subset has the, the rigid motions in. And so the kind of play that we will do is we will look at our point set to begin with, show that it has a large set of very rich actions. This means we have a very large group energy. We can use this to get structure over the affine group. Then we can use the structure over the affine group to get structure over our point sets in two dimensions. So this is so. This energy 
um, is just if you have a multiplicative group, then you can look at theta one, theta two inverse and make sure it's equal to theta, theta three, theta four inverse. And the same trivial bounds apply from before. It's bounded between S squared and S cubed. And you can define it without the inverses. And it turns out there's this nice, this nice result of spread off that bounds one by the other. And it turns out over the affine group, we have a way nicer sort of Berg, Semmerdi, Gower, Freiman type regime where you can go straight from energy bounds to coset structure very quickly. Whereas over the real numbers, this is much more difficult to do. And so this is a theorem of that we'll mention later of Peter H's, uh, Rush Newton and Rodev and Warren. Okay. So there are four steps involved in the proof. The first is just to show that if you have few triangles, then you have lots of very rich actions. The second one <clears throat> is that many rich actions lead to a large group energy. Both of these are relatively simple steps. Um, the, the third one is that if you have rich symmetries and a large group energy, then you get a large set energy. So this translates from the affine group back to your, your, your point set. And this is also relatively easy. And then the third thing is more about getting the structure out. And this is where we need some, some bigger tools. So it splits into two cases, depending on the kind of subgroup of the affine group that we land ourselves in. The first case is an additive one, and we need to use a lot more tools from additive combinatorics to deal with this. The second one is a, a multiplicative one, but we can just use the, looking at the kind of subgroup that we have to deal with, the analysis directly there gives us a much stronger result. And um, we'll see why we can't do this for the, the additive subgroup in a sense. Okay, so step one, um, few triangles give many rich actions. This turns out to be relatively easy. Um, if you have exactly P, M, P squared triangles, uh, then it turns out there have to be lots of values of K that are both large and that make the uh, number of actions of that richness, sorry, lots of values of K that are big, and that there are many actions that are that rich. Like this is, and it turns out if you do this, you can run a proof. So so Amoshi has this complex sum product proof where he uses pigeonhole principle, and this was my inspiration for the for the proof. You sort of look at the if it turns out if you have m p square triangles, you can sort of bound the the sum of this this energy from both above and below very very nicely. And if you don't have lots of these good k's then it turns out you can't achieve the wall bound. So this is a very simple proof. You just sort of walk into sum and, and make it work. So the whole thing could work just through doing dyadic pigeonholing and you pulling out a rich, a rich thing like this. But the problem there is you would lose a log and we can't afford to lose a log because if we do, we can't use the Freiman and results near the end. Okay. So the second part, is that you can use cauchy schwarz to get bounds of the ball, energy bounds of the following type. So if you take your K-rich parcel symmetries and run them through um, cauchy schwarz you end up with bounds like this. And it turns out if K is large, then this turns out into a very nice energy bound. So you're using the K as large as possible six times and using the S as large as possible once, and you get the energy bound being as big as possible. So it's S to the power three. Right. So the second step you should just say is saying if we have a big set of very rich energies, then our affine energy is as large as possible. It's S cubed with a small loss. Okay. And then this is when we use this this very powerful theorem. Um, and it turns out so if you have um, uh, an energy in the affine group, then you can bound it from above by in this sort of context of um, incidence theory, you sort of think of this as lines we're going to, in a minute, correlate to cosets of subgroups. And here it says, if your energy is as large as possible, then either you have a very rich vertical line or you've got to have a very rich non-vertical line. 
Um, and so, yeah, this gives you a very quick way of passing from a big energy bound to lots of points in a in a cursor. Okay. And so this is also where these two cases will come from. Okay. So we should talk briefly about lines in the affine group. So the affine group we're just going to deal with is the multiplicative group of the complex numbers, semi-directed product with the complex numbers, and it acts, as you would imagine, it uh, applies some kind of twist to x and then some translation. And vertical lines correspond to cosets of translations. So if g was just equal to the identity here, this would just be all possible translations. And non-vertical lines are going to correspond to cosets of stabilizers. So these are stabilizers are just going to be um, rotations around a point. And then these cosets are just translations of this. Um, and so a near, uh, near optimal energy bound means that we have a large intersection with either this coset of translations or this coset of stabilizers. Um, and this is what gives us our additive and multiplicative energy results. Okay. And so this is just showing how that works. It turns out if you have lots of points in here, you get lots of pairs PQ that all give you the same kind of combination on the right-hand side. And then you can take pairs of these, of which will be about P squared. And given that S is about size P, so you have P ways to choose what they're equal to, you end up with PQ. So step three is also very simple. Um, and step four is where kind of more of the interesting work is. And so we split into a multiplicative case and an additive case. Did anyone have any questions about the first three steps before I go into step step four? I went through them very quickly because they're not profoundly interesting. I mean, they work, to my knowledge. Um, okay. So we split into a multiplicative case and an additive case. And the multiplicative case, we can use the fact that if we have a stabilizer group in the affine group, when we intersect this with the group of rigid motions, this will reduce the dimension. So in the affine group, it would include all these scales from this point. But now when we're just looking at the, the rigid motions, it's only rotations. So we go from a two-dimensional to a one-dimensional group here. And we know that S is a, a set of rigid motions, and so it must be trapped in this one-dimensional slice of this two-dimensional group. OK. And so for the additive case, this trick doesn't work. If we look at translations, and then we try and intersect this with rigid motions, we stay in two dimensions. And so we can't say we can't get any more information out of it by, by looking at this sort of restriction. Okay. And so this is where the, the weaker comes the weaker result comes from. Um, so we can't, or at least I do not know of a way to use this this group structure explicitly in this additive case to improve the result. I sort of tried to use it in combination with the lines. Once you've got all this line structure out, can you then go back to the group? But you end up with a, a situation where you have a positive proportion and a positive proportion, and I don't have enough control to bring these together. OK. And so for the multiplicative case, uh, we lie in a stabilizer of some point. And it's clear to see that if you take a point and you take this action under everything in the stabilizer, you're going to get a circle. And it's just going to care about how far your point is away from this, this x. So if you think of the orbit of the stabilizer, then you get a circle. And for a cursor, it turns out there's exactly one translation in each of these cursors. And so you can think of the same thing happening. You just take the, the orbit, and then you move it by this translation, because you can apply the translation afterwards. And so all the cosets and the stabilizer itself take a point and its orbits are going to be circles. And then to get a very rich circle is very easy. You just come up with some digraph where you edges are based on, oh, P goes to Q under this, this action. And then maximal saturation and handshaking gives you a vertex that has an out degree that is around the size of P. And this just shows the out degree then means, oh, well, all these points 
must be on the circle described on this orbit. So this is this is how you get a very rich circle. And the additive case is much, much trickier. Um, so we have to use the energy directly. And in good news, we have a very rich, a uh, very sharp bound. Otherwise, we won't be able to get any wine structure, as discussed earlier. Um, and so first, you use Balog Severini Gowers to find a subset with good additive structure. Then we use a, a theorem of uh, Akshat Mudgal, um, who's at Oxford uh, presently. Um, uh, yeah, uh, which and he uses so he uses the Green Rouge theorem um, to to prove this, and we can adapt his argument to make sure we have both a rich wine and we have a positive proportion on these rich wines. And so, yeah, Akshat's theorem is the following. So he cared more about uh, linear transformations in general, but you can use this just with the identity. And if you have this, then he gets lots of parallel lines, and all, a lot of them are rich. And then you can show that there is this positive, well, this proportion that's not covered by these parallel lines. And so this uses the additive structure that you've got from this generalized arithmetic progression quite explicitly. And you can sort of adapt this argument by caring about different things to get this positive proportion on lines that are at least sigma rich. So this is where you get your your original line out, and the reason it's so bad is it becomes it comes from the dimension of your generalized arithmetic progression that you get from the Feynman theorem, um, and then the second part of this all this parallel lines comes from the fact that you are you do have a large intersection for the generalized arithmetic progression, and so if you understand what that looks like, it turns out to look like a bunch of parallel lines, or at least most of it looks like a bunch of parallel lines. So that's that's how you get both parts of the theorem. Um, and I think, yeah, I have some open questions, but did anyone have any any questions about the the proof? No, okay. Very interesting. I uh, didn't catch everything, but uh, it looks like a really nice approach. Thank you. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, so where it's there, let me know. You can send them over. But yeah, so the, the things I can't do, which I find more interesting at this stage. So I think few distances should mean few triangles. The only way I know how to get a handle on triangles is via group actions. And so this leads to hard questions then about questions about group actions on distances. So you can ask the following question. If you have fewer than, not even the strongest thing, but say fewer than P distances, do we have a lot of very rich actions? And so this well, is... That, that would be a major breakthrough, right? Because that would be yeah. the best structure we have for a few distances so far, if that's the case. Like, if this is true, then you found this real structure for a few distances for the first time. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Yeah, I don't know how to prove few few distances and point a few triangles, but if anyone knows how to disprove it. So presumably there could be an a counter example that I'm not clever enough to think of that does have few distances but many triangles. So, so I'm trying uh, to think of hmm? what do you define as few here? With this with the square root of the log or without? Uh without I think would be enough. Okay, because you don't get enough explicit structure from the triangle result, right? To to need the extra log, you don't need the log. Because I mean, because then you have more more constructions that only have a linear number of distances, like points. Uh, okay, okay. I I would be very interested in any counterexample if if it was if you did showing that you needed the log would also be very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't think so at this stage, but I don't have a good reason. Other than I think triangles are cruder generally than distances, right? You don't have logs cropping up in any of the things to deal with them. Um, you don't care. You care about a wider class of examples already. So I don't know if this was true. How can triangles then tell distinguish between logs? And then 
Yeah. So if you wanted not to deal with triangles, but want to deal with distances directly, how would you make the approach work? And so the only place where it fails for distances is step one, showing that it has lots of very rich um, actions. And so you can show that there is some polynomial number that does have the correct number of um, rich, right? The, there is some richness that has the correct number of actions, right? It has as many actions as possible. But the problem is it's, it's weaker than one. If we have one for triangles, we have something less than one. I can't even tell you what it is explicitly. Just know if it doesn't exist, then everything breaks. So it's not even explicit. But even with this, you can construct a non-trivial energy bound in the affine group, right? You gain a half. Uh, sorry, you gain a third, but you need to gain something like a half plus epsilon to say anything. So if you got anything like a half plus epsilon, then you would be able to gain an energy result. So you'd be able to get not something non-trivial for the energy of the point set. Um, but yeah. Uh, and the other question is. Is there a way to avoid using Balogh, Severity, Gowers, and Fryman for this the second set? Because if you could, then you could improve the the power of that result. So currently, I get something non-zero, but it would be nice to get something stronger. It's very frustrating to have one result be something positive and the other result be linear. So I don't know how to do it. So I think that's all I had. Uh, thank you.